I'm Liz Brown Swanson, and you are watching RPV City Talk on the road with the great mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Mayor Eric Alegria, and we are sitting on this blustery day. It's beautiful out. Um, at one of the city's most historic landmarks and picturesque, we've got the Point Vicente Lighthouse right here behind us. And in fact, this lighthouse property um, is one of the city goals to acquire or lease this from the Coast Guard. And the mayor is going to share all about this goal and everything else happening in the city. So take it away, Mayor Alegria. Let's start right here. What's going on with the city discussions about the lighthouse yeah, property? Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, it's rather exciting at the beginning of this year, the city council directed staff to, uh, to to approach the Coast Guard and begin discussions about either a joint use opportunity or the acquisition of this property. Our city council would really love to have more access to it so our, our residents can enjoy it. So discussions have begun and we are hopeful that they'll continue over the next couple of months. I think this lighthouse, I can't imagine how many photos and paintings have been made. It is iconic. It was built in 1926 and um, it is definitely world famous sitting uh, 185 feet over the ocean. It's 67 feet tall and it is magnificent. It'll be very exciting if the city could at least lease this. Um, what kind of interesting facts would you like to share with the community about this lighthouse? Of course, the lens that once sat in it is now sitting at a, right next door at our interpretive center. It was loaned to us. So just take, you know, share some of the interesting facts about sure, the property. Sure, the lighthouse is part of this greater property of Point Vicente and uh, leading into, of course, the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. It has a great and rich history that started in the 1950s uh, with the United States Army actually using this large site for rifle range for target practice. Uh, and that uh, eventually they, they sunset this property as an active site and the county acquired it in the late 70s and ultimately um, transferred it over to the city in uh, 2004. And of course in recent years, 2019 and 2021, most notably new ex exhibits ha and uh, displays are now being presented inside the Point Vicente Interpretive Center, including the Fresnel lens that you right. mentioned. Right, very exciting. I was there when um, the city filmed the lens coming down and being dismantled and then this famous French lens. So all of our residents out there, if you haven't been visiting the Interpretive Center, um, you need to go, you need to check out that lens. It is a great resource and this will be incredible. Keep us posted on the negotiations with the Coast Guard. Um, it is really special to be sitting right here, right? We're, look, we're looking around us, there's, you know, these this property is vacant. The, the Coast Guard is no longer staffed here. Um, and I think the last lighthouse official keeper was in 1971. Um, but with that, anything else you want to add? Because we are going to travel down the road to another historic landmark now. Let's go down Let's there. go down the road to Ab Cove. Abalone Cove was a special celebration. There is now a monument in honoring of the Gabrielina Tongva Native American Indians. Um, talk about this special memorial um, that just was erected and there was a big city celebration just recently. Oh, it was a wonderful day uh, a couple of Saturdays ago when we celebrated the unveiling of this new beautiful monument celebrating the first peoples of the county of Los Angeles and and the first peoples of the peninsula, the, the Gabrieleno Tongva uh, people. So we had a chance to uh, have a couple of special visitors, uh, the county supervisor, Janice Hahn, uh, Assemblymember Al Mirasucci came by and so did more than 200 of our own residents to come out and, and witness the unveiling. And of course, Chief Morales, uh, as a representative of the Tongva people, uh, came and, and gave special blessing, prayer, and, uh, and we also had a little bit of music as well. So it was a celebratory day in our community and uh, really a wonderful day. It was great to be part of it. That was so fabulous, again, to just showcase the wonderful history of the Native Americans in our community. And of course, again, right next door at Point Vicente Interpretive Center, there is a Tongva exhibit as well, um, again, to encourage residents to go in and learn more about the wonderful history here. Now we're going to move on and talk about things before the City Council issues. We always do this every month. Um, where you highlight important topics that the council is making decisions on. And the big uh, discussion, of course, now is on the city's draft housing element. Um, it's a complex issue um, regarding our uh, housing in our community. And with that, I'm going to let you take it away and explain what this is all about. Sure. Thank you, Liz. So our city, uh, along with the other cities throughout the entire state of California, uh, go through a regional housing needs assessment process uh, that identifies the number of units that each city's anticipated to produce um, 
and uh, our number this year is 647, a, a dramatic increase from, from our prior eight-year cycle. So we've been working closely with our consultants to um, identify areas in the city by which those 647 units, and they are you know, mixed income levels from all the way from very low all the way up to above moderate uh, number, the types of unit in terms of the types of units. And our city council had a chance to see a draft uh, example of where uh, those units could could be zoned uh, throughout the city and had a chance to react to those units. And wasn't there like 50 potential sites around the city that some of these units could be built? And of course, depending on which neighborhood the housing was being put, you were hearing from residents about that. For example, Mayor Lest residents, I noticed you know at the first meeting there that they were, there was a lot of public comment from them and the council reacted to that. Talk yes. about that situation. Yeah, and that's the intent of this process is to, you know, give our, our uh, residents a great opportunity to provide input through this process. As you mentioned, one example of an area where, at least in the draft, uh, there were some units identified was the Miraless Plaza area. But ultimately, council uh, directed staff to remove that area, knowing that that's a very difficult area in terms of... Um, in terms of traffic and um, and getting people in and out and infrastructure required to support those units and so uh, council did give direction in a, in a couple of areas and I'll, I'll touch on those uh, so along with removing uh, mirrorless plaza from the plan uh, it also uh, requested that staff look at um, accessory dwelling units i think we've talked about that before on the show and certainly in council meetings uh, we only had a handful in the city, but you know some of our residents are looking to do that, and those can be allocated towards that 647 number. And uh, so we're looking to increase our number of accessory dwelling units that will contribute to that overall number. Uh, but ultimately, we feel that more public outreach needs to occur. I think our residents are really just starting to understand what's happening. And um, we've asked staff to, to take further steps leading up to our next meeting in February to uh, make sure that um, our, our residents have a chance to hear all about the, the housing element. And, and have input. I know that I did hear residents, the public speakers were stating, you know, we, we're just learning about this. Of course, this city's been discussing it for years. It is in the city newsletter. It's on the city website. And that is really, I think, one of the best resources that our residents can take advantage of is to log on to rpvca.gov. You can click on housing element. You can see all that's going on. We have so many different ways, like today, we all get our information whether it is social media, um, but we are, the city is putting it out there, and I think in fairness to the city. Also, the thing is, you're not, the council's looking like, I don't want to say the bad guy in this, but really, the, the city try is trying to fight this process. You already appealed the situation of 647 units saying, this is too many for our community to absorb. Can you talk a little bit about that, yes. the steps yes. you've taken to say, wait a minute, we don't, we're not, we don't want this? We, we did, uh, as a city appeal, uh, the number, that, the allocation, um, and we, we tried to get the number reduced. And the reason for that was, and the basis for our concern has been expressed around the fact that, you know, 90% of our city is in the high severity fire zone area. Um, and, and therefore, uh, this city is uniquely, you know, unequipped to provide uh, commercial corridors that will allow for the, the space that's, you know, being required to provide for the units. Unfortunately, that, that appeal was denied. Uh, so our city continues to evaluate and look at uh, legal options as it relates to the housing units. But in the meantime, uh, we, we do need to continue to work to uh, refine the housing element and prepare for the plans for uh, the 647 units that are uh, allocated to our city at this time. I think during the conversation, people are saying, you know, why so many units? Well, the state's seen whatever the population growth has been for the state, but we haven't seen the same kind of growth in our own community. So it's interesting how it's being, you know, you know, pushed by the state, but it may, doesn't really necessarily fit the needs of our community. So that, that's, that's where it's point. at. And our city has been rather consistent in terms of having 42,000 residents mm -hmm. roughly uh, over its long history. thing you want to add, this is, like you said, going on um, for the residents that want to be informed. Would you suggest looking at the plan on the website? Look at the plan on the website. Get involved. Uh, as, as you noted, yeah, certainly uh, communicate with your state representatives uh, and make sure that you're uh, understanding, um, you know, what the impact to our community is. And um, educate yourself a bit. I think that's my overall message. Okay. Well, thank you for that and, and uh, helping us navigate through. Um, one thing you've been navigating for a while, that is uh, parking issues at Del Cerro neighborhood. Um, and you've, the city has worked really hard over the last few years to figure out solutions. 
um, to help with the impact of the preserve there and all the visitors there. And you've come up with the Park Mobile app system for parking. It started as a pilot in the summer. It is now full gear, but you're learning from it and you're tweaking it. And that came up at council this month. Yeah. What, what, what have you done to sort of revamp? And uh, c can you give us an update on this the Park Mobile the, system? Thank you. Yeah, yes. this is part of the ongoing saga of our, our effort to balance, as we've talked about, neighborhood impact of the preserve, which, you know, during the height of the pandemic really reached a fever pitch for our community, but really had been an issue for many years before that as well and uh, also ensure that we have proper amount of public use. We want people to be able to access the preserve and enjoy it. So we did institute the plan uh, of having our park mobile app. Uh, it's been in place for at least now, I guess a little over a quarter. So we just had a little bit of data to look at and we learned some lessons from it. One was we were acquiring um, uh, in advance, you know, the day before uh, reservations uh, to be completed. Uh, and because we realized the usage was rather low in our first quarter of use, and I think one, because the pandemic has slowed down and our visitation in the city has slowed down, but, but also because uh, people just aren't using that reservation system, we, we gave ca uh, the staff direction to go ahead and remove that requirement of booking that far in advance. So hopefully that will um, you know, encourage people that come to our city and are looking to park to just go online and... Uh, you know, put it in the reservation and, and get use of the those spaces and get access to the preserve. Of course, the ultimate goal is to sort of um, help that neighborhood have less of an impact and keep their quality of life. Are you hearing feedback from residents? Yes, I, I did uh, have a chance to actually go speak to one of the HOAs in recent weeks and, and received lots of good feedback. I think they're very appreciative of the fact that the council and recognize the council's put a lot of effort into trying to get this right and make sure that they can enjoy their quality of life and, and uh, not be so impacted as well. Right. Well, our rec and park staff for the city has been super busy out there trying to uh, work with the community, make this, put this all together in a way that's effective and everybody's happy. So it's win-win because let's face it, RPV, um, everybody wants to be here and enjoying this beautiful I can understand why. community that we have. Um, uh, we're also going to talk more about uh, parking. Um, we're going to bounce over to Ladera Linda just up the road. That was on the city council agenda as the excitement going forward as you're about to be building the new Ladera Community Center. Um, but now you've been taking on, uh, you were presented with a landscape plan, a lighting plan, and a safety security plan for Ladera Linda as well as they talk about parking there. So um, can you bring us up to speed on Ladera Linda? Yes, we're, we're getting closer and closer to breaking ground. And this was just one more milestone in that process. You mentioned the three elements of what came in front of council recently, landscape, safety and security and lighting. And we actually had this item come to council in September uh, and recognize and council provided direction to, to staff to please uh, go back to some of the uh, HOAs in the community that were impacted, um, talk to them and work through, you know, a reduction to the overall plan. And so they did do that. And I thought they did a rather nice job of that. And I thank those in the community who provided input. Uh, for example, our lighting plan reduced the number of light poles from 36 to 17. The number of security cameras was reduced. Uh, and then also we added um, shutters to um, protect the facility as well. So those are just some of the minor changes. but. Uh, Definitely encourage people to take a look uh, at the, the plan and, and look at those staff reports and uh, see all the information that's coming out. But, uh, you know, council was uh, very excited and uh, very supportive with those minor modifications to move forward and to the next step of this uh, particular project. So yeah, we're, we're getting closer. On the subject of Ladera Linda, they also um, came before the council and uh, asked for what would be a residential permit parking program uh, on certain streets within the neighborhood to help yeah. with the impacts. Um, can you share what your, how you navigated that? Sure. Uh, as part of this broader plan to deal with the, uh, the community center and the park, and then also with preserve parking, which um, has been an aspect of that sort of area as well, uh, council has looked at and um, ultimately has a plan to open the forestal gates to allow some of that preserve focused uh, access to occur. But in conjunction with that, there's a, a uh, really huge sensitivity to the community itself. And so there's been work with that community to um, implement a permit parking system. It's not something we want to do everywhere in the community, but there are certain areas like Del Cerro that we just discussed that have really been 
negatively impacted by you know the use and and given um, all that's going on with that area, including AOISO soccer games, oftentimes um, the council overall felt it was appropriate to approve that permit and uh, uh, that permit parking plan for that community. So that will be implemented in, in short order. We're going to be seeing, I'm sure, Ladera Linda on future agendas as we continue to get closer to that groundbreaking. Um, and of course, I feel like with, with all the efforts that the council is making to address residents' concern for quality of life issues, is always the con the consideration about public safety. And with that, I'd like to talk more about public safety in the city overall. Um, in fact, there was just the seventh annual Peninsula Preparedness Expo that was held. Um, I went to it and attended it. Um, it was the first time they did it at Peninsula High, but the focus again was public safety and preparedness and RPV had a fantastic booth. As we always do, the city is out there as a leader, um, trying to lead efforts to keep our community safe with that. What's going on with our city? You want to talk about just sort of what we're doing to keep our community safe? No, I appreciate the mention of the expo. Uh, and so glad you, you got to be there as well as I understand that it went really, really well. Uh, this is important to our city. This is one more way that we're trying to make information available to our residents. And uh, especially when we bring these experts out who are incredibly knowledgeable in, in terms of emergency preparedness. And I think we're so good in this show talking about emergency preparedness. Uh, but I'll just highlight in short, you know, we want to make sure that uh, everyone in the, the community has a plan, uh, builds a kit. Uh, here's some of the items. I, I, I thought this was quite an interesting list, but it's like you know, the top 10 the top 10 items that you need. It almost feels like a Dave Letterman kind of <laughs> top 10. But uh, here I'll mention a few. So water for three to 10 days, food for three to 10 days, first aid kit, of course, flashlights. I didn't think about this one. This is kind of interesting. Medications. So for those folks who have medications, making sure you have that little bit of extra medication uh, is is important. There there are other items, but um, you know, ultimately we want our, our residents to always be ready and be prepared. And yes, next, next year go to the expo if you didn't this year. You can always go on to ready.gov forward slash kit. Um, you can get started on your kit, get great information, and our city's emergency preparedness committee and our city um, with jesse who is our um, coordinator for emergency preparedness has unbelievable information on the website again rpvca.gov go there and check it all out and continue our conversation about public safety i know you serve on the peninsula's public safety committee um, you work with all the cities on the hill regionally you meet uh, quarterly and discuss crime stats and everything we can do to uh, to keep crime down. What can you fill us in on the latest? Yes, the the, the latest is you know we are seeing a little bit of an increase, um, and and when I say increase, it's relative to, to prior months and and prior quarters, uh, as it relates to vehicle burglaries. So um, you know make sure that you put your valuables out of sight. I think that's always the important message. And then I found this rather interesting, but it's also important, and our captain was recently sharing with us that there's actually going to be a catalytic converter etching event that's coming up. So look out for information on that on Saturday, November 13th. Uh, catalytic converters are um, perceived as having immense value and, and therefore are being um, taken quite a bit throughout um, not just the peninsula, of course, but the greater L.A. County. So if you have a catalytic c converter, uh, perhaps look out for that event and, and how the, you can etch your... And the date converter. was November 13th. Yes. And you can just show up, bring your bring your car and, and, and do that. Yes. Um, also, this neat routine about, I've never heard this till recently, about 9 p.m. Get into this 9 p.m. routine um, where residents are encouraged every night at 9 o'clock. Make sure your doors, your windows, everything's sort of locked up. Turn on the lights and timer and... Uh, of course, I'm up till midnight, so that should be easy night for me. Owl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a night owl, but anyway, I thought that was interesting. Night, yeah. Me too. You get all your kids in bed by then. Yes. All yes, right. And that will segue into our Leadership Academy because you're going to talk about that, but the uh, members of the Leadership Academy that the city's running, they just toured the Sheriff's Department. So explain what the Leadership Academy is all yes, about. Yes. No, I love the Leadership Academy. So um, we have some of our, you know, most knowledgeable, most engaged uh, residents um, that participate in our committees and commissions that we talk about oftentimes on this show, well, we need some way to, to engage people in the city and give them more information on the city. And so the Leadership Academy, which we haven't done for a couple of years and we've just reinstituted, uh, allowed an opportunity for about 15 residents 
to actively work with our staff and, and they went through five different sessions that went over every aspect of the city essentially. I had a chance to actually go out and, and speak to the uh, speak to the group the other day. Yeah, we're going to share footage of you now while you uh -oh. were talking <laughs> to the group at City Hall. Was, and, and what was your message to them? Oh, my message to them was uh, we need you. Uh, the city is what it is because of uh, decades of participation by uh, by citizens like them and uh, we'd love to have them you know get on a commission or committee or contribute to the community in some other way so uh, those residents who weren't aware of the leadership academy there are definitely ways to participate in our city and uh, reach out to us and find out how you can help us out i also did participate in it so i got a better understanding of just how the council does their job and and uh, how you you know the agendas get put together and all that there's so much fascinating information you can learn and about local government because this is where it happens you know starting right here in our your own community so I'm not sure when the next session is going to kick off this one at 15 participants and the fact was it was two high school students future leaders I mean I think it's fabulous that this staff that puts this together really reached out to all segments of the community not people that might just run right now but yes. down the road Yes, wonderful Future leaders. Well, well, I love seeing the diversity of the group. It's and, wonderful. And also, I think, too, I think there's this understanding, like, if you want to be on the city council, you probably should serve on a committee or commission first. Not necessarily, but it does help. It, it, right? it does. And uh, in my, I think in recent history, uh, pretty much every council member has at some point participated in, in uh, one of those. And before um, you served uh, on the council, you were on the Finance Advisory Committee, Correct. is that right? Yes. yes. Well, we're talking about local leaders, but now we're going to move on to the biggest leader of the land, the President of the United States of America, because our city council and this mayor has signed a letter to POTUS. You have sent a letter to the White House regarding funding for the Portuguese Bend landslide mitigation project. So share about this letter the impact it might have and how we might get help from the white house we we are looking uh we have been on a campaign of uh engaging and in fact over the over the uh, last couple of days uh, the city manager councilman dida and myself met with uh some staff from senator uh, feinstein as well um, as a letter that we've sent to the president we're actively engaging uh, those federal and state leaders who we believe can help us identify uh funding that may be available to help us with our Portuguese Bend landslide. So um, we're finishing up the environmental uh, impact report and should be complete with that in the coming months. And we're preparing to uh, hopefully implement some of the solutions to that landslide. And it's a $30 million project, so we could use some help. Yes. And the money that you're going after is part of the uh, $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill for capital projects. Yes. So it seems like we could squeeze out a few million for us. What do you think? We're hoping. <laughs> we're hoping that that infrastructure bill, which, you know, it's really speaks to, you know, this unique project in our community. Uh, yes. So we made that point to the president, and we hope that to hear from him and his administration. Because let's face it, if this slide continues to go like it is and we get this road that we're on right now, sitting here, bringing you the show, PV Drive South, that was as a main arterial, it would be it would wreak havoc on our community and so at so many levels. It, it would. And it's important to note over the its history, it's cost us about forty five million dollars in investments to continually repair it. Right. So, um, you know, it, it continues to cost us money. We need to get it fixed. We're right. working on it. All right. Well, this is very exciting. And I hope you're going to share your response from the White House as soon as you get it right here on City Talk or certainly at the council meeting. We will stay tuned for that. So now we're going to move from the White House to the North Pole because we have some exciting announcements between Breakfast with Santa starting back up soon before you know it on December 11th. And there is an ice rink coming to RPV City Hall and the mayor is going to tell us all about this excitement. Oh, thank you, Liz. Uh, this will be the first, I hope, of maybe future years where we get to see an ice skating rink outside our Civic Center property. Uh, and um, we're going to have it synthetic ice skating rink 2000 square f feet and it's going to be available to uh, to the community to come and enjoy throughout the weekends of december and the week of um after the christmas as well right i see skate times are going to be between one and eight friday through sunday december 3rd the 10th the 17th and right like you're saying right up till the new year and 
not only are you going to be skating, but you're going to have this backdrop of Catalina and this beautiful view. It won't get any better than that. Start sharpening your skates and get ready to take on the mare in a little one-on-one uh, <laughs> on, one on the... Get ready, folks. Yes, yes, this is very exciting. Also, as I mentioned, we have Breakfast with Santa. This is an annual event put on by the city. Super popular, sells out. It benefits the REACH program. Um, so share about that. That, again, will be December 11th. You can go on the city website to find oh, out more. Well, I hope our parents in the community pay attention and come out and enjoy. I've certainly gone out in prior years and enjoyed seeing Santa. Kids love it, and it benefits a really great program for our community. Yes, the REACH program, we work with um, uh, members of the community that have special needs, and they do so many cool things, and they're just we all just have so much fun uh, celebrating with them at that Breakfast with Santa event. So check it out on the city website. I can't believe we're you know, talking Christmas and skating, but we're going to look at another a uh, holiday that just passed, Halloween, um, by the time the show um, airs, has come and gone. And the city had a fabulous trunk or treat event for the first time up at City Hall. And it was packed with little goblins. Your little goblins were there. Um, yes. Uh, just kind of recap that special celebration at City Hall no, called Trunk or Treat. Trunk or Treat was a wonderful time. We had lots and lots of people. I think more than a thousand people came to enjoy uh, I want to say we had maybe 40 or so cars that were uh, set up with wonderful ornaments and uh, of course candy was being handed out to all these wonderful kids. We had jump jumps, uh, we had vendors uh, providing meals and lunch and everyone had a great time. It was a really great way to kick off Halloween. I think too, people are just so wanting to be together considering the kind of last couple of years we've had with the pandemic and it was nice in a safe way that people could come out and be outside and uh, have a spooktacular time. Yeah, that's right. We're so, the city's so happy that it can play a role in helping our community come together. Yes. All right. Well, we're going to be wrapping up here. And I know you as mayor have been out and about, whether at the uh, Trunk or Treat event, uh, down the road here at the Tongva event. But uh, there's still lots more I know you're doing. So how about sharing other mayoral, mayoral activities for the month of October? Uh, lots going on. I'll just highlight uh, that I, I, along with the mayor pro tem, enjoyed a breakfast with uh, Marymount California University leadership and St. Leo University leadership as they announced their merger. So That's we very had a exciting. To community. Yes, and it's such a great resource to have this college campus right here in our. Um, beautiful community. Um, so that's really fun. Any other special last minute mayor announcements too that you want to add? No, just happy holidays everyone. Next time we're together we do our annual review of all the great things that happened in 2021. We'll have lots to talk about and one thing that's been great so far we've taken this show every month on the road for the most part all over Rancho Palos Verdes to share with what's going on here. So uh, mm -hmm. we have to pick your final show for the year. Have you decided yet? Not Stay yet. Stay tuned out big, there. Big thank you to our people. <laughs> TV. You guys have been wonderful. It's been great to go out through our entire community and, and cover all that's happening well, here. I'm, so thank you to all of you. I'm grateful to have this team. We're looking at Jeff and Carlos and Maria. Um, yeah, it takes a village, as they say, and this is a good, great village or paradise to be in, right? That's right. All right, that's going to wrap up this edition of RPV City Talk on the road from the Point Vicente Lighthouse. Um, thank you for watching. Be safe out there. And again, thank you, Mayor, for joining us here today. Thank you.